The 1960s were one of the most tumultuous and divisive decades in the world's history. Marked by the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, and the anti-war protests, political assassinations, and the emerging generation gap. Just as black power became the new focus of the civil rights movement in the mid-1960s, other groups were growing impatient with incremental reforms. Student activists grew more radical. They took over college campuses, organized massive anti-war demonstrations, and occupied parks and other public places. The intensity of the decade led to a generation of young people dropping out of public life altogether. These hippies grew their hair long and practiced free love. Some moved to communes, away from the turbulence that had come to define everyday life in the 1960s. In the summer of 1969, more than 400,000 young people trooped their way to the Woodstock Music Festival in upstate New York. A harmonious three days that seemed to represent the best of the peace and love generation. But on the West Coast, in the City of Angels, a ministry run by Tony and Susan Alamo saw an opportunity in the eyes of a young generation of kids looking for something good to believe in. Their foundation religiously recruited the streets of Hollywood, California, looking for runaways, drug addicts, black, white, blue, or green. If you had a pulse, the Tony and Susan Alamo Christian Foundation had a place for you. We went to church with them. When I walked in, I was mind blown because it was people my age. They were all young, hippies, college people. They sang gospel songs and they all knew the words. Tony and Susan, affectionately known as Susie, had a power from their podium, an ability to put these crowds of wayward youth into spiritual and very emotional trance-like states. Susan Alamo moved to Los Angeles with dreams of becoming a movie star. She got her start as a beat girl. Bars would hire her to sit at the bar and look pretty, which would lead to men coming up to her and buying her drinks. Only those drinks were just tea in a fancy glass, charged at top shelf liquor prices. An admittedly brilliant hustle. Susan quickly realized that she had an ability to own any room she walked into. The rooms she captivated most? Churches. So she and her daughter would pop up at churches with a cute song from the child and a powerful word from Susan and walk out with pockets full of cash from the tidings of the service. This hustle, according to Susan's daughter, Christian, kept them afloat. Susan and Tony Alamo met one night when she and her 13-year-old daughter were hanging out at a bar called Aldo's. Tony walked in and Susan struck up a conversation thinking Tony might have some connections to the music industry in hopes of getting a record deal for either her or her daughter. Tony entertained the conversation and schmoozed Susan, regaling her with lies about how he helped promote the Beatles in hopes that she was a wealthy woman that he could leech off of. When at the end of the night, neither of them had the money to pay the tab for the pitcher of beer they drank, Susan apparently saw something in Tony's ability to embellish his life status and decided he would make the perfect accomplice to her church racket. Tony, still green in the ministry game, was confused as to what Susan wanted with all these filthy hippies that she was recruiting. See, Susan had a vision, a vision of success, and that vision required a flock. Susan began preaching her message from the street on a weekly national broadcast from a syndicated show she was given. Her booming baritone voice pontificating about the end of days and vivid details had masses of young souls spellbound. Tony's confusion quickly washed away when he saw the lucrative money-making opportunity that he had attached himself to. Tony was the briefcase, and Susie was the Bible, creating a two-headed monster that blazed a path down a road paved with not-so-good intentions, and they never looked back. By 1970, the Alamos had over 200 followers living in a three-bedroom house, facing constant harassment from the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department for sanitation code violations, loitering calls, and suspicious activity in and around the house. Susie sought a more accommodating place. They bought a piece of land 45 minutes outside of Los Angeles, further isolating their followers from potential outside influences. On a bus called Heaven, the Susan and Tony Christian Foundation packed up and moved into their new home, but not before followers handed over those pesky and sinful worldly possessions. How do you support yourselves? I mean, admittedly, that when people come to join you, they give you all their worldly goods. I suppose no, that... most of them don't have a thing. No. Most of them don't have a thing. I'll make a deal with you. Every hippie that comes to the church with money and possessions, I'll put salt and pepper on him and eat him if you'll eat the ones, the other ones. Would you do that? <laughs> Most of them don't even have shoes on their feet. 
you know, not all of these kids came from poor surroundings, believe me. And uh, boy, they'd find out that somebody had some big money. <laughs> all of a sudden they'd be going, I see such a great work of God with you. The followers also took up jobs on nearby farms and would sign their weekly paychecks over to the foundation. Needless to say, with two to 300 people signing over hundreds of dollars weekly, the Alamos amassed a large amount of money very quickly. In order to evade Uncle Sam, Susie and Tony started a nonprofit organization. You see, nonprofit organizations are exempt from federal income taxes, which is good because the foundation needed all that money to keep their hardworking followers in good spirits. Jesus' children in this commune live in squalid conditions, the fortunate sleeping in bunks 20 or 30 to a room. However, Tony and Susan, as befits absolute leaders, are adequately housed. You were never good enough. After my son was born, I was so tired. I couldn't even hold my baby in my arms. I felt like he was just going to fall out on the floor. Susie, when she talked about the mothers, you might as well put the F word to the end of that because it was almost like, you mothers, you're so lazy. We didn't have pampers, we had cloth diapers, but a lot of times there wasn't water, so you couldn't rinse out the diapers. So then they'd get maggots. So the next thing you know, you're getting over the pulpit, you lazy mothers letting maggots in your baby's diapers. I mean, it was really hard. Even through appalling conditions, the flock remained faithful that Susie and Tony Alamo heard and preached the direct word of God. Susie even convinced her followers that their sins and shortcomings were giving her terminal cancer, that she was only able to stave off through her connection with God. By 1973, literally hundreds of cults had popped up all over the country. People were lost after the Vietnam War, the assassination of a president, and the palpable tension of generational racism and inequality in the air. In this chaos, loud and confident voices promising answers and purpose were a beacon of hope. Tim Cahill, a writer for Rolling Stone magazine, actually spent a few days with the foundation for a story and saw firsthand just how appalling the living conditions were. And while he says he never saw any beatings or brainwashing take place, he also acknowledges that people are often on their best behavior when the cameras are rolling. The Tony and Susie Alamo show was a variety show of sorts, with a live band, music numbers, and testimonials from their followers saying exactly what they were told to say. It had the appearance of a powerful evangelical experience. Tony and Susie, but mostly Susie, at some point started demanding that their followers beat the devil out of their children to save them from hell. For Susie's daughter, Christian, now a mother herself, this was the final straw. She decided to leave the church but her mother refused and threatened to kill her if she left. In fact, according to Christian, her mother accompanied a crew of followers to her room where they mercilessly beat her for even having the audacity to think she could leave. Christian got the police involved, which apparently spooked Susie because she allowed her daughter to leave with her children, but not before warning her of the grave mistakes she had made by going against the foundation. The compound in Sagas, California, eventually ended up in the same predicament as the three-bedroom home in West Hollywood. Detectives snooping around concerned workers weren't getting paid. The California IRS skeptical of how much money Tony was bringing in. And just sheer growth in the number of followers had the foundation aiming their sights on a big new church far from the religious oppression of California. And in 1975, Susan and her congregation packed up and moved to Arkansas, the place where Susan grew up. I was born and raised in the Bible Belt, state of Arkansas. I was nine years old when God came down from the heavens and touched my little body, racked with tuberculosis, dying, touched me and healed me in a non-believing, unsaved house. Now that story, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of versions of that story. She hated Arkansas. She felt she had been treated badly. That was one of the reasons she went back to Arkansas after she'd uh, gotten into the millions. Um, she was going to uh, show them. 
the foundation basically took over the town, opening several businesses that operated off of free labor and shuffled the profits between businesses and into offshore accounts that were next to impossible to trace. The Department of Labor filed a lawsuit against the foundation in 1977, alleging that with all the businesses that they operated, with people working 12-plus hour shifts, they had evaded paying almost $20 million in wages. They even had their followers construct a 243-acre compound called the Georgia Ridge, which was like a fortress. One big contributor to the foundation's exponential growth was children. Unprotected sex was encouraged. And soon, a whole generation of children born into the cult had arrived. These children had no agency, no personal decision to turn their back on society and live with these odd rules. They were simply born in the wrong place at the wrong time. Tony and Susie oversaw everything from the spec house, a massive building with Greek-inspired columns in the front. In this building is where the reports were taken. That's right. The cult members were encouraged to rat on each other if they witnessed infractions. From talking to someone they weren't supposed to, to laughing in the prayer room. Children reported on their parents. Parents reported on their children. Followers reported on themselves. All out of fear of going to hell. Tony loved preaching vivid, terrifying sermons about what awaited sinners in hell. Tony had a flair for the dramatic. Sporting dark shades reminiscent of cult murderer Jim Jones, with a persona that fell somewhere between Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley. By the time 1980 rolled around, the word was out on the Alamo Foundation all around Arkansas. They were those neighbors. The ones you whisper about when you walk past them in the grocery store. The ones you tell your kids, you're not allowed to play with them because I said so. They were the oddballs around town, but they had a brilliant solution. Propaganda. The local people started rumors, you know, they were afraid. And Dyer, Arkansas is a little town. So we wanted to show that we were good neighbors. So they took pictures of the kids swinging and playing in the pool and swimming, showing that we're normal, everyday people. And it was all staged. And they showed a um, pig farm. Well, yeah, we had a pig farm. And if you got in trouble, you got sent to the pig farm. Like reproach to work at the pig farm. At this point, years of free labor, a hit TV show, and followers handing over every cent they had put Tony and Susie in somewhat of a celebrity status. With country singers the likes of Hank Williams Jr. and the iconic Dolly Parton at their beck and call for pop-up performances at their Arkansas restaurants. Bringing stars like these to this small town, as well as riding in a fleet of Cadillacs, aided the Alamo Foundation in winning over a lot of the town skeptics. Susie was one of God's children, and God wanted her rolling in style. But this dark ride took an even darker turn when Susie revealed devastating news. She had cancer, but like for real this time. By Christmas of 1981, Susie was no longer showing up to church services. The followers were ordered to pray for her around the clock. People were literally passing out from praying for hours and days at a time. But the prayers were unsuccessful. At the age of 56, Susie, the church charlatan with the gift of gab that built a multi-million dollar enterprise, was dead. Tony Alamo was devastated. Not only because he worshipped the ground that Susie walked on. I mean, how could he not? When they met, they were both trying to scam each other out of a pitcher of beer. And then he proceeded to watch her build a dynasty, a dynasty that he had keys to. But the second part of his devastation and fear was now he was the only person with a key. Susan left behind millions of dollars, properties all over the country, and thousands of followers. And all of these ventures were fueled by one thing, preaching. And when it came to that, Susie was Michael Jordan. Go ask the Chicago Bulls how easy it's been for them to find a replacement for MJ. The queen was dead. But the sins of her past were still lying in wait. And in 1982, one of her biggest sins was now Tony's problem. Remember that Department of Labor lawsuit? You know, the $20 million in unpaid wages? Well, the case went to trial three weeks after Susan's death. But don't forget, Tony had a gift as well. The gift of embellishment. And he put his gift to work very quickly into his role as the leader of the Alamo Foundation. He told the followers that he was in court battling the one world government and that the foundation was under attack because they were exposing the evils of the world. They were told to pray 
in order to give Tony the strength to defend them from this ominous threat, this powerful enemy, the United States government. The U.S. District Court ruled that the Alamo Foundation owed $19 million in back wages and overtime. Tony Alamo appealed the verdict. He had enough money to drag things out in court for years if he wanted, all while continuing to benefit from a tax-free status and unpaid labor. In 1983, troubles worsened when the IRS opened an investigation into the lavish lifestyle he and Susie were enjoying before her death. The stress of lawsuits and investigations, on top of the weight of his new crown, was a lot to bear. And Tony didn't hide it well. When Susie died, Tony was just a monster. He was yelling from the pulpit and chewing people out. It was as if he really hated everybody. And people took it. And when he saw people take it and not leave, it just kept getting worse. The grip Susie had on the flock was clearly slipping under the reign of Tony. But there was speculation that he had a plan to fix it. Between 1983 and 84, Tony was spending a lot of time away from Arkansas. He was traveling to Los Angeles, where he met and eventually married Brigitte Gillenheimer. Brigitte looked strikingly like Susan, and some of the former cult members and cult investigators believe Tony may have planned on introducing Brigitte to the followers as Susie Resurrected. But Brigitte didn't sign up to be a church prophet. She wasn't even Christian. Brigitte quickly realized the hell she had fallen into. Tony demanded sex three times a day, and if he didn't get it, he would pray to the Lord for answers. Spoiler alert, the answer was always to beat Brigitte. Brigitte realized that if she satisfied Tony's sexual needs, she would be safe. Not just physically, but financially. It's hard to make it in fashion. It's very expensive. You need someone like that to... um pay for the bills don't forget tony was the briefcase he knew how to sell a product and with thousands of unpaid workers a fashion designer wife and a flair for the dramatic alamo designs was born picture the worst looking ed hardy shirt you can imagine rhinestones glitter the whole nine now eat that shirt okay now picture a denim jacket airbrushed by one of those mall kiosk people from the early 2000s. Now vomit the shirt onto that jacket and you have a Tony Alamo original. The jackets were a hit. Everyone from Mike Tyson to Brooke Shields was ordering custom Alamo jackets, which gave him more notoriety and even more money. After evening prayer, the children of the Alamo Foundation would be bussed to what was essentially a sweatshop, their little fingers applying rhinestones to denim jackets. The children were never paid a penny, obviously. The problem the IRS and the Department of Labor kept running into was despite hearing about the child labor law infractions, they had no proof. At the Alamo Foundation, it's okay to lie to the devil. And the government was the biggest devil of all. So as far as the followers were concerned, they were volunteers. Nothing bad was happening, and the government simply needed to butt out. But in 1985, Tony's luck ran out. His stalling of the Labor Department suit reached all the way to the top. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld the verdict, and Tony was ordered to pay his workers. Four months after that, the IRS retroactively revoked the Alamo Foundation's tax-exempt status. Tony was spiraling. He was threatening Brigida more frequently, saying the Lord would kill her if she left him. He was reading the Old Testament and fixating on passages that mentioned having multiple wives. And his fondness for young girls at the compound became a major red flag. Less than two years into their marriage, Brigida filed for divorce from Tony. By 1987, the foundation had expanded all over the country. Financially, they were thriving. But the only thing keeping the followers from deserting the violence and exploitation was the fear of burning in a hell that had been so vividly painted in their minds. Tony was like the Bob Ross of describing how much hell sucked. In October of 1988, Tony Alamo was charged with child abuse for ordering a severe beating of a child whose father had left the cult, but he did not turn himself in. Tony was on the run from cases, both legal and civil, but was still giving orders back in Arkansas by phone speaker. The beatings worsened, separating children from their families worsened, and punishment became as frequent as breathing. Tony Alamo was angry and afraid of losing his freedom. 
He was a petulant and erratic kid with a magnifying glass, burning the ant colony that had served him faithfully. Tony managed to stay on the run for years. Because of his absence, he lost the civil suit for nearly $2 million. Because Tony was on the run and not paying damages, the court was authorized to go to Georgia Ridge and take assets that would add up to what he owed. This news was received at the compound as the government is coming to raid us and likely kill us all, which understandably caused a tremendous amount of panic at the compound. They dropped everything and fled, literally leaving pots on lit stoves. Now, I know this has been a strange journey so far, but brace yourselves, because what I'm about to say next is certified insanity. On the way off the compound, Tony ordered a few of his followers to steal Susan's body from the tomb she was buried in on the property. That's right. It appears Tony wasn't confident on his hold over the following if they weren't on the sacred ground away from Susan's body. So he decided to resurrect her himself and take her on tour. After the so-called raid, the followers were divided into factions all over the country. Unstable living conditions, a financial institution crumbling slowly but steadily, and a dead body on the move. Tony Alamo was in full-blown disaster mode. He called up an Arkansas journalist and went ballistic over the phone about how he was going to try a local judge in God's court. And after the verdict went Tony's way, the judge would be taken outside and hanged. That's a terroristic threat against a government official. A threat that the FBI took very seriously. Tony was now wanted by the FBI. Just another humongous turd on a mountain of shit that he had gotten himself into. A task force was put together and a manhunt was underway. On July 5th, 1991, after years on the run, U.S. Marshals tracked and located Tony using phone triangulation to Tampa, Florida, of all places. He was placed under arrest. And when he asked an agent, how did you find me? The agent responded, it was divine intervention. Susan Alamo's body, however, was not with Tony. And he asserted that he had no idea where it was. Tony Alamo was facing several charges, including child abuse, threatening a federal judge, and tax evasion. Somehow he was acquitted on all charges. When a few of the jurors were asked why they voted the way that they did, some of them responded they just didn't want to encroach on his religious freedoms or his First Amendment rights. Tony, now located by authorities, still had other charges to face. He had a child abuse charge pending in California, one of the several charges that he evaded when he went on the run in the first place. He was released on $200,000 bond to fight his case as a free man. Slowly but surely, he called a select group back to Arkansas to rebuild a base of operations. We missed him. Those were all the friends we had 20 years And, you know, you're always hoping you can go back. So I went and visited Fort Smith. So thankful to be here and see Tony. I praise him for his mercy and thinking of us and calling us and having us come to the foot washing. And let's praise and thank the Lord for his mercy. From the ashes of Georgia Ridge rose a new Tony in 1992. A Tony who was on a crusade against the government, fighting a war during the end of days, and a new following bought this pitch hook, line, and sinker. Tony slowly started pitching a pro-polygamy stance at the new church, pointing to verses in the Bible for validation. With several charges still looming against him, Tony seemed unfazed, making colorful TV appearances, directing his following once again. Everything seemed to be going back to whatever normal was for the Alamo Foundation. Authorities knew they had to prioritize their strongest case. In the summer of 1993, Tony Alamo went to trial in Memphis, Tennessee for tax evasion and tax fraud. He had some followers come down for moral support. Tony had invited some of the brothers and sisters to Memphis for dinner. So I went and I see Tony and then there's some of the girls. They're 15 or 16 years old and they're waving at me. And I wave at them because I had taught them school and I babysat them. I loved them. And Tony starts talking and goes, come here, my wives. And he starts putting his arms around all of them and kissing them. And I was horrified. His pathology mutated. And at some point, um, apparently, he decided to go with little girls. On June 8th, 1994, 
Tony Alamo was convicted on all tax charges. He was sentenced to six years in federal prison, but the cult did not die. He continued running the foundation from behind bars in Texarkana Federal Prison. His persecution for his religious beliefs by a tyrannical one-world government made the followers almost more devoted than ever, seemingly. He ordered his followers to purchase properties in a small town close to where he was imprisoned in preparation for his eventual release. His phone calls were recorded and disseminated as required sermons for listening. In 1998, federal authorities prepared to release Tony, but not until Susan Alamo's body was returned to her daughter, Christian. The local government threatened that if Tony did not deliver the body back to Christian, the day of his release from prison, he would be rearrested and placed in a local jail until the body reappeared. So her body was anonymously delivered to a funeral home. Tony was released and his sights were now set on the child brides in the home he had set up for himself while he was away. He had brought me in. That's when he said the vows, all that. And he said, you know, after the marriage, you're supposed to consummate the marriage. So, okay, just not really understanding what that meant, but that's when he started putting his hands up my shirt and down my pants and everything. When he was raping me, I was pushing him off of me, telling him it hurt. And he told me, don't do that. Like, really, don't do that. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're pissing me off. Of course, I was terrified to even tell him that he was hurting me. Like, I was just pushing him off. And of course, I was crying. I was crying. I remember him saying things like, it's going to feel good later on. It's like that with the other girls. In my head, I was scared. That's when I really felt scared. All I just kept thinking was, okay, when this is over, I'm gonna go play outside. When this is over, I'm gonna go play outside. That's all I kept thinking. It was 1998 and I was 14. I was eight. By this point in 1998, there were defectors online telling their stories in chat rooms, but it took the bravery of the young women in Tony's house to come forward eventually to try and stop a true demon in human flesh. After eight years of a hellish existence, in 2006, a young woman named Amy took a stand and escaped the house. Amy, now 22, got a bus ticket to Oklahoma to find her father. The whole way there, she was certain that the bus would crash and she'd go to hell. Because Tony told everyone that's what would happen if they ever tried to leave the church. But no matter how vivid Tony's descriptions of hell were, she decided hell was better than spending another moment in that house. Amy's escape opened the floodgates. She gave the other girls the courage they needed to get away from Tony once and for all. The fear of Tony was still within all these young girls, however. So when the FBI contacted Amy, she refused to testify against Tony. It wasn't until they approached Desiree who was just eight years old when Tony started raping and abusing her, that they finally had a witness to corroborate their accusations. Desiree put the FBI in contact with other wives and informed them that Tony photographed the young girls in the nude. A case was being built, and a search warrant was obtained. In 2008, the home in Falk was raided, and at least half a dozen girls were found in the home. Tony Alamo was not there. But over the next several weeks, authorities used the evidence obtained in the raid to seek the custody of the ministry's children. The children were eventually collected and put into foster care. The parents were given a choice. Raise your children outside of the ministry or lose custody. Some parents left with their children, but many did not. Once again, Tony Alamo was in the wind. The FBI got word that he was possibly at another compound in Los Angeles. But by the time they arrived, he had vanished on the road again, calling into major news outlets to give his insane side of the story. The Bible states that the legal age for marriage is at puberty. I'm not married to any teenage girls who don't want to be. I'm 74 years old. I don't remember reading that in the Bible, sir. And I went to I, I went to Bible class every Sunday, Sunday school, and I don't remember saying anything about it. Teach you I mean, because kids are reaching you puberty you at the age of 12. You don't know anything about the Bible. So you're 
the people on the news, I love the way they freaking treat him on there because it makes him so mad. And they're just like, all right, sir, all right, enough of that, you know? I love it. The law of God is what you're going to be judged by and everybody else on this that, earth. That, that's fine, sir, but let me just let me just ask it's you. It's not for, only for, fine, it's going to really happen, okay? okay? Well, thank you, sir. But oh, he time. looked crazy. Oh, he looked crazy. So, I mean, that was like, wow. He's not gluing right now, but he hadn't been arrested yet, and he was toying with them. Are you in Arkansas at this time? Uh, in Arkansas? No. Where no. Where are you right now? On Earth. Which city are you in? What a city you're business at. The phone calls once again ended up being Tony's demise because the FBI put a trace on his phone and located him in Flagstaff, Arizona. Because they had no evidence of child pornography, because of the fact that Tony would have the young girls destroy the evidence weekly. Convicting Tony Alamo would come down to the bravery of the young girls he abused for so many years. With five of his brides willing to testify, Tony Alamo was indicted on 10 counts of interstate transportation of a minor for sex. He was transferred to Arkansas to await trial. By the point of the trial, the witness list had grown to around 30. Former members and victims were all prepared to come forward to tell their truth to give their testimony. Tony Alamo was found guilty on all 10 counts and was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison, 175 years to be exact. A legal team led by David Carter has won over $1.1 billion for the children who were raped and or beaten by Tony Alamo. They are still seizing assets to satisfy the judgments. Even as Tony was shuttled from prison to prison, a group of followers remained faithful. When asked about his plans for secession after he died, he was adamant that he wouldn't die. So such a plan was unnecessary. Tony Alamo died in prison in 2017. Indoctrination is a powerful tool. It's more powerful than logic, than truth, more powerful than death. The Alamo Christian ministry continues to exist today because people would rather believe in a lie than nothing at all. Tony Alamo was not a smart man. He was a coward and an abuser who struck fear in people in order to earn their submissiveness, which is oddly a compliment. Even garbage can look like gold through the power of embellishment.